We're good. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. It is August 15th. Uh, it's 6 01 ish. Uh, meeting of the Beach Advisory Committee. We have, may have some people joining by Zoom. However, those joining by Zoom uh, can't participate because we don't have that capability here. And we also don't have Wi Fi here. So uh, it is what it is. Uh, Fred, you want to introduce yourself and listen over? Uh, Fred Stafford, uh, Chairman of the Communications uh, Group. Paul? Paul Hayes, uh, on a group, that's about it. So <laughs> I am Barry Engel, and I work with the Traffic and Safety. Paul Hogan, I'm the current chair. Carol Sherman, I'm the secretary. Uh, Pam Sifanci, I'm the vice chair. Uh, Tom Ferrari, I work with Barry on uh, Traffic and Safety. And John Dykstra, I'm representing the Board of Select. Thank you all. Thanks for all being on time. Uh, Carol, first item on the agenda is to approve the minutes, which Carol sent around this afternoon, or earlier, mm -hmm. but I read them this afternoon. Uh, any comments? Any questions? If not, can I have a motion to approve? Motion. Approved. Thank you, Tom. Second? Second. Second is Paul. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everybody. Um, Next is uh, public comments for anything that's not on our agenda. Uh, are there any comments, questions, before we uh, go further? Still admitting people there, Tom? Any more? Yes. Yeah. Great. Uh, I don't see any hands raised, uh, so we'll continue on. Um, next, we have committee reports. Um, Barry, want to go first with um, uh, public safety? Sure, absolutely. So, uh, Tom Ferraro and I met uh, with Art Delay, I'm happy to say he's here in the room, as well as with Tom Adler. Uh, we reviewed what we had uh, sort of come, where we were today, and uh, we put a couple of ideas out there. We are going to be meeting in the next week or so uh, to really come up with some recommendations that we will bring to this forum, hopefully for our next meeting. And we just heard that we have requested um, that we do some speed counts on the roads we did a few years ago and got a report from the chief and also on the added bike road and the West End Kings Highway, time permitting and I'm doing those as well. Um, people continuously say, everybody's going fast, but there's more cars, but traffic study is one way to do it and the department has the capability to do that and we saw a setup. Someone's all set up on the bottom, so that's what it is. But well, I may add also, Gary, the idea that uh, Art has come up with about possibly having something that could go to uh, renters and people in the area about what the expectations are for use of the roads. That's a public education, right? right. I mean, we spoke with, uh, with Fred a little bit earlier, and he's uh, on side with that. Okay. Thank you, Gary. Fred, anything you want to report on communications? Um, nothing new on communications. Other than, uh, Pam went around and picked up all of the uh, bird signs about not touching dead birds on the beach. I think we're past that. And we still need to get a meeting together with the town about the new signage and exactly what they want as far as do's and don'ts on the beach. Because there's some things in here that are not being, re are not being enforced. And if they, I think if they can't be enforced, then we probably shouldn't have them on the list. You know? Unless they are part of the ordinance for right. the rules. Mm -hmm. Then the question is... Like the launching of motorized boats. I don't know where you would even do that on the beach, except for the rivers. Right. You know? So maybe that's not something you need in the general sure. rules. You know? so. just, just as a point of argument, yeah. I, um, if it's not something you'd like to have happen, um, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you include it? Just for a matter of the sheer number of things. The fewer things, the more things you put on, the less people are going to read it. That's all. Okay. You know? And so, if it's not a problem, then I know what you were saying. Like, well, maybe you're keeping it from being a problem. But like with launching boats. I don't even know where you could do that on the main beach, you know, how you would even get down there. 
I could push a jet ski down on a uh, on a on a little wagon thing from Dyke Road. Uh huh. Blue tires, piece of cake. But uh, up jump. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've never even seen a wave runner. Like, nor have I. Nor, seen, nor, do, nor do I ever not, want to. Not so plastic. plastic. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. But I think the thought was to um, look at our existing signage and our existing mm -hmm. other educational materials. Mm -hmm. um, there have been some suggestions on how to do the dog part similar. Right. So sort of, yeah, yeah, we'd like to get the dog part to be something that would be interchangeable. So whatever the regulations are on that day, that's what would be there, not the entire year, because it's hard for people to decipher what it is. So maybe going to a system like they have for the water quality where you can slip something in and out or, or bolt it on or whatever at the you know, appropriate time, just to make it as clear as possible. Carol? Oh, I'm sorry. I found that little brochure about when jobs can and can't be on the to be very helpful to our guests. They were going to come over and came up in the Ferrari or something. I wanted to get a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a yeah, okay. <clears throat> Moving on to natural resources. Carol had a comment or two on the birds. Prepping plovers. Maine Audubon was out with the Portland Youth Corps to take down five explosures. The remaining ones should now or very soon be removed. Many birds have left for places in the far south. We will have the privilege of now seeing all the birds that migrate through this rock speech. Many travel thousands of miles. Some of the birds travel thousands of miles nonstop. Um, I, this is an aside, and I, you know, Ken doesn't know I'm doing this, I'm not doing this for any special. I bought this book uh, from Ken James, who is a retired surgeon who lives here in Kennebuck. And this is a book of birds that are just in our area, and it is gorgeous, and it's beautifully done. And he actually won a prize for it this year as an outstanding book by a private uh, publisher, I think. So that's an aside. Carol only gets 10%. I get 10%. <laughs> uh, but for the plovers, the state of Maine in this year, 2022, it had 140 pairs. They have a possibility of 252 fledged uh, piping plovers. Last year, they had 125 pair and fledged 213. So obviously, they've done better again. Goose Rock Speech in this year, we had uh, 12 pair, and we have one chick left, and we have 23 fledged. So wow. we're going to have 24 chicks. And last year we had nine pair and 22 fledged. And in 2020 we had six pair and three and 13 fledged. So we're doing better every year, and this was by far our best year, even though we lost 10, 10 nests. So um, just because I'm curious about what other people do. Agunquit fledged 35 chicks, Wells fledged 40, Fortune Rocks fled, fledged 15, Hills Beach fledged 4, Old Orchard Beach fledged 8, which it always pleases me to beat them. And as far as the lease turns, we did have them come to the beach, but I have no data from American Audubon. Uh, but when I do, I'll put it in Facebook and on the contact. Any questions? Why would this year be a study I think I'm not a professional. My thought is, and I've been asked this before, I think there's a couple of factors. When we had COVID, so we had fewer people on the beach, and I believe that the Gunquit Wells closed their beaches, and I think that's why they have so many chicks. But we had fewer people on the beach. We have not had um, high spring tides that have washed them away, and we have not had dog incidences. <coughs> so that's now that's from a non-professional. Do we know if the chicks come back? Can do I? They, do they tend to come back to the same? Yes, area? they do. Yeah. So that so the ones that fledged last year are very likely the pairs that are mm -hmm. excellent. Sometimes they come back to the exact same house. 
amazing. Hey, everybody, we need to take a three minute break. Anyone who's parked there needs to move their cars to back here. There's a meeting tonight, and uh, I know we put it at our last meeting don't park over there. We may have neglected to do that this time. So I'm going to ask for yes, a, not, not even just there's a large spot, just anywhere. Well, there are there. two or three that are okay over there, but the rest say reserved for the, the uh, firemen. Oh, right. If it says reserved for firemen, you don't park in there. Why don't you go clarify that? Okay. <laughs> I think I, I thought I was in an okay spot, but. Um, I'm going to go move. Oh, no, it's are I don't know if it looks good. At least it looks green. Well, that's all I care about. I don't. I don't look and see which is a right. Yeah. Green, which is green, and it can be mowed. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> She did not. What a change. What a change. It's wonderful. Yeah. Here with the rest of the country has had even the hot spell we had wasn't yeah. terrible. Five or six days. Yeah. And eighties instead of triple digits are proper. Yeah.
No, I just, I'll edit it out. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Two other quick ones on um, natural resources. One is um, wanted to compliment the Conservation Commission for doing a serious tackle of the invasive uh, plant species along the entrance at uh, Dyke Road. They worked a couple of days there to get rid of Oriental bittersweet and a lot of stuff that was killing all the good stuff there, as well as had killed the tree pine tree or spruce tree um, and um, we had some talk with them about maybe doing a um, um, native plant demonstration garden on one side of both sides there so Mary Ellen who's here to who's on natural resources is talking with them about that so uh, we may come back with a proposal to this group it's really um, an amazing job it's just yeah. beautiful and are the marked trees, are those lilacs? Are those the surviving lilacs? Yes, there's a lot of lilacs in there. Yeah. That you yeah. never even knew they were there. Right. Babies right. were there, but they just never had a chance. So cool. Yeah. And um, the other is people keep asking about water quality. And um, the water quality has been um, remarkably good all summer after a bad start in June. In the first week, it seemed like we were going to have a bad summer. Uh, but um, we've been really lucky, we've had no rainfall. So there seems to be a high correlation between rainfall and, uh, and uh, good conditions. But normally, we, you know, in some, some recent years, we've seen much, much higher numbers. Um, we've been very lucky. So that's the upside of the drought, of the, drought, the severe drought. Um, any other committee? that I missed? Um, okay. Um, old business. Um, the only item I had there was follow up on questions regarding storage of gear on the beach. Um, those of you who watched or were here last month, uh, there had been some questions raised about uh, why there were stickers on some equipment that was not um, supposed to be where it was supposed to be, and there were repeated tags from the town telling them to remove it, that it was unauthorized, it was not an appropriate spot. Um, we did follow up with the police chief, and um, it appears that uh, from his message back to me, which I shared with the committee, that um, what I guess some of us thought was happening was that stuff that is not supposed to be there was removed. They're actually not doing that. Um, they do not think they, uh, what did he say? He said, uh, as for town taking control of private property, I am unfamiliar with any commitment by the town to take possession of private property for non-police actions. We would become responsible for such property and have no facility to store or safely and store securely. Um, as always, we would um, respond to issues that people bring to our attention and of course anyone um, any beach 
uh, use agreement signer who has a complaint about something um, and they're directly in front of their home, um, they would uh, quickly respond to those requests. Um, the, the areas that were raised were not in um, beach use uh, owner's properties. It was on essentially town property. So that's what I have to report back. Um, comments, questions? Well, why are we going to take things if we're not going to do anything about them, I guess? Oh, point. Right, this is the tag and uses. Yeah. Well, I think it comes back to the same point in terms of what we're going to put on the signs or the rules. That, to me, there's no point in putting things on those signs that there's no way to enforce. So maybe the signs will be pretty simple if we're not going to enforce them. Well, for the properties that are in the beach agreement, I think the town takes a slightly different position yeah. than on the rest of the beach. Um, so under the beach use agreement and under the ordinance, the town has an obligation to those owners to do certain things, and included is to... Uh, in those 25 spots. In those 25 foot spots. Uh, I think, I think and no, not only there, but on the, on the property, they yeah. essentially own that to the low water mark. Yeah. The town uh, agreed not to challenge their title, and the town, in doing that, agreed to um, enforce these rules. These were part of what was negotiated that people weren't going to haul all their stuff and leave them on what was essentially private property. Yeah. But I don't know that the people, I don't know who leaves these things, but my observation having walked the beach is that a lot of this stuff just, there's a lot of people here at the beach have, that have no idea about the beach use agreement, nor do they have any idea which properties of are part of it. So I just think it's a really confusing situation. That it is. <laughs> John? I, I would think that the ones that have multiple tags are basically abandoned equipment. If people come down and see it has a tag, and they're not going to honor it, they'll take the tag off. So the fact that there are multiple tags says to me that someone with uh, more money than care has bought a kayak and left it there. Uh, either never uses it or just left it there for us. Of course, we don't even know if we can remove them at the end of the season. There are kayaks and, and uh, abandoned boats. Yeah, there's a couple each year. For this, yeah, which for this same reason, the town really doesn't have the authority to be able to take something of private property and, and store it. Once you do, you now basically own it. You take all responsibility. If anything happens or it gets stolen, the town is liable. And that's that's the situation the town's in. Yeah. I'm curious about Go ahead, that. Kate. Um, and I'm not a police person, but it strikes me that if we put it out there that it is impermissible to leave private property on the beach and then maybe put up, it will be taken off the beach, it will be considered abandoned property, I think it's gotten really out of hand, more and more so this year. On another issue, which I would like to bring forward, and I'm not saying tonight, but well, I still with think... I, well, it's related to this one. It, and it looks overall, if you look at the east end of the beach, that we are countenancing the storage of personal equipment in terms of kayaks and, and whatever on the beach. Even the area that John and Ed put set up the rope area on Dinghy Point, which I understood at the time was meant to secure the dinghies or things that were being used to get out to the mooring locations have now got all sorts of things tied up there or thrown on top of it, including massive, you know, inner tube things that I've never even seen the size of before. Um, and I understand why we facilitated the kayak storage. I understand completely why we were trying to protect the dune grass. And we are protecting the dune grass. I understand that. Another option of protecting the dune grass, I mean, I, I walked the beach one morning, um, it was around, I think it was during 4th of July week, and I just got curious, and I started walking up instead of down at the water's edge with my dog, and I started moving up closer, and I did not include the Dingy Point stuff that was there at Dingy Point, but from just past Dingy Point, 
before it got to the tides. Didn't include the tide stuff because their stuff was within their 25 foot. But from there to, I don't even think I went all the way down to Jeffrey's Way, I think it was Broadway. 110 kayaks, paddle boards, or canoes, some forms of things stored on the beach. Most, a lot of them stored, you know, with the, it, with the, at the, and I, We're a victim of our own success. Well, that's the problem, I'm saying. I think we saw a problem. We came up with what we thought was a very good solution. But at this point, particularly, and I'm not saying, again, this is something I want to do some research on and what other towns do, for example. I'm happy to, you know, sort of work on that over the fall and come back to you. But I do think we are enabling people. People get the message, it's okay to leave stuff here. And they are leaving. I mean, I've asked people, how many people do you actually see out using kayaks on a given day? And I keep hearing back, I mean, I don't usually go down to the beach from the very peak time, but they keep saying, eh, you know, maybe one or two or three max. So we're enabling people to just come and dump their kayaks there. And we are getting to the point where at high tide, there is less and less beach on the east end available. So we're, we're prioritizing some people's play toys over um, people being able to use the beach for the purposes we think of normally the beach, sitting in Sunday and whatever. It's just an issue that it, it comes out of what you were discussing because it also relates to the problem of even if we were to decide at some point that we wanted to change the rules and say carry on, carry off, which I think a lot of other towns do, and I, as I said, I want to look into that, we still have the problem of how are you going to enforce it. So that's just... Are, are, the, are the kayaks uh, privately owned or...? Yeah, okay. they're, they're all private, they're not rentals that... Right. that yeah. Well, like... Someone like, may rent one and store it. Yeah, yeah, people rent for a week and then take it from their house <laughs> and drag it to the beach and then... Uh, but I would do it for doing it. Right, right. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. But, Kate, my only two observations. One is go have a discussion with Tom Bradbury and, yeah. and express your concerns because they own a lot of the land yeah. and they have a very, uh, he should be aware of your concerns. Mm -hmm. And um, his view has been um, he's thrilled that people recreate and he's really happy it's not in the dunes because he's all about protecting well, the, the dunes. The dunes need to be protected, um, absolutely. And, um, you know, so private. The, the, yeah. the ordinance and the we're not like any other town. This is a very unique agreement, one of its kind, mm -hmm. uh, which gives uh, property owners the right to store uh, stuff on their beach and to let others store right. on their beach too. Um, there are people who aren't here, and people store there, and they know that, and no one objects. So stuff does stay there. Mm -hmm. But that's if they want did want that to happen, that property owner could stop that. Right. And I agree that we have, because of our unique situation, the beach use agreement and the, some property owners have rights that are different from other property owners who don't have rights to the beach in front. I mean, I've, I've thought for years, I have no idea how the CSOs can really tell which is which as they, and which have different um, conditions that, that they can operate under. There, there is a map. Yeah, but... Uh, Anyway, can it's I go back to the... It's not marked on the... I know, it's, it's just not marked. I think it's still very difficult. Can I go back to the issue on the table? Absolutely. And um, I guess from my perspective, I mean, I grew up in a town where junk that was found, mm -hmm. bikes left at ball fields, uh, whatever. The police picked it up. They took it. Once a year, there was an auction. Yeah. They, they, they had a notification of what was going to get auctioned off. If you didn't go claim your bike or your whatever, it got auctioned off, and the money went to a local charity. So I, I now that was in Jersey. Um, they used to do that year when I was a kid. Every year they have a bike auction. Right. Yeah. So I don't think. And would they would they confiscate bikes? Is that what it was? I was too young to know. Oh, yeah. But I know my father was cheap and bought me one. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it, you know, it's something to ask. I certainly could uh, could could bring it up. I mean, as a read, if that's what you'd like to carry forward. I mean, to, the, to the board of selectmen, I'd be pleased to carry that forward. That's my sense. Where, where yeah. People, yeah, I think we need to find out. Effectively, if anybody leaves someone there, he's trespassing on the town's property. Right. Yeah. You can't go, I assume, you can't go to Cape Corpus, a, a town place, 
and put my car in there and just say, okay, I'm going to leave it there forever. No, you can't. That's an absolute right to get rid of it. And if I left stuff on a ball field, it would get removed. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't really see, I know it's a complicated problem. So these aren't problem. tags at Dingy Point, because Dingy Point you can leave here. Yes. yes. Kind of yeah. Yeah. So these are tags that are on a right of way of the town. These were on a right of way on what street? Right, uh, right at the end of Bel Air. Bel Air, Bel -Air. Bel -Air. Right were the on. ones that had the tags that showed. Got it, got it. No, that's exactly correct. You shouldn't be able to leave it. Right. But in the same area, you've got uh, kayaks. And then in this one particular case, under the kayak, they put chairs right. and a skimboard you know, on the side. And so it becomes this pile now of stuff. Right. Yeah. And the, the one with the tags on it is actually like a 10 foot dinghy. That is, if you go in the Bel Air path, which is right before the tides, just go straight in, and that boat is right in the middle of the beach there. And it's, you know, it's been there all summer. Yeah. And that doesn't look like it's moved at all. No, it's, it's, it's abandoned. That's, uh, yeah. So why isn't it removed? It's a good question. So I think the sense. I don't think we need to take a vote, but the sense, I think, of everybody based upon the feedback we've gotten from people is um, to request the town to find a way to uh, remove and store and... I'll get a reading. I'll get a reading. Well, what does the town do off the beach? I, I don't know. I, mean, I, I think they held some stuff at the PD, but we have the Old Town Barn, which is... If you come up Old Cape Road, well, you guys probably come down, um, I still call it the Dump Road, uh, Beachwood Avenue, and you go by Highway, and you keep going, and you come up the hill before you get to the intersection of Walker's Lane and Old Cape Road. On the left there, there's a, a little cinder, I think it's cinder block building, it's kind of an yeah. open area. That was the town barn for years and years and years. And I think we just use it for storage. I don't know what's in there, but it's a possibility we can fill that up. Or, I mean, nothing has to go inside, as far as I'm concerned. Well, but if the chief, the chief is going to want to secure it. I know yeah. if he yeah. takes possession, he's going to feel yeah. as though our department is responsible for that. Sure. Got it. Okay, John, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anything else on that? Anybody, anybody in the audience? Members? No? Okay. Um, new business, there is um, one item which was um, similar, well, not similar, uh, questions regarding how the tides is consuming the beach um, uh, with uh, all kinds of gear. They have moved their stuff back in into the 25 feet, I think, um, their storage area. It seems like they're doing a better job there. They're aware of the concern. Um, but the question, I guess, is that they take up this enormous area of the beach. Um, I watched today for a while, um, and they seem to only have chairs out there for active uh, guests. Uh, someone came on, they went and got an umbrella, they went and got a towel, they went and got a chair, they put it in, they looked around for a spot, they found a spot. Um, I, I don't know what happens at 10 in the morning. Uh, I know some people told me they used to just, and I've seen it. You know, uh, but I, I think maybe they're not doing that this year, where they would just put out 50 chairs, you know, straight out, taking the whole area before anybody's sure. even on the beach, um, which it would seem is not really uh, permitted under the beach use agreement and under the ordinance. Um, I guess. The other concerns, you know, people coming from other hotels, and so the number is just increased. Uh, oh, I've heard that from a number of people concerned that it's really becoming a, a commercial area. It's, it's a place to family, it's a place to people, the owners, etc. But there's so much coming in. I, mean, I don't know this a fact, but supposedly eight or nine properties now and being bussed in and uh, it's being overrun, is what I'm hearing from some of our neighbors. So there's a concern there that uh, people are, don't, just don't like the direction it's, it's going. And you've got Ocean Woods potentially uh, being added to that. Uh, 
uh, 32 cottages in Bucks I heard. I don't know where that stands. No, that, that's what's drawn. Yeah, yeah that, that's, 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 yeah. Oh, that's, that's been withdrawn. But it's, 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 it's going to be something. It's going to come back. It's going to be something. It's going to come back. But overall, that, you know, what's becoming of our beach? Yeah. And if we, you know, I've heard people say that if we don't slow this down or just really manage it, we're going to end up with another old orchard. You know, that's not that there's any wrong people there, but I don't think that's what um, people living at Gershaw Beach are looking for. So where are you going to put the Ferris wheel, Barry? Where are you going to put the Ferris wheel? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, the thing with the tides, too, is that chairs are going wide. You know, they're not just going within the uh, footprint of the tides itself, you know, parallel or even with what their property would be. They're spreading out. So, you know, they're having a much bigger footprint on the beach. And what they do lots of times is they'll put the chairs close to the water, and then there's nothing in between. But I think people visually get the impression that, oh, this must be a private area because all of these chairs are all the same color yeah. and umbrellas and everything else. And then they don't go into that area in the back or I know in the past, because I witnessed the uh, so this is going back a couple of years, but somebody from the Tides telling a mother with two kids they couldn't stay there. It was private. That ended. Yeah, and so I don't, I don't know that that's... Were they on I'm hopefully not. Tides Cares? No. Or, no. no, they were just in. No, and they were... They, probably, that used to happen, but I really yeah. don't think that's happening. Yeah, th I don't know if it does or not. I think they just did. Yeah, I mean, I think um, to educate people that anyone can sit there um, their rights are only in the first 25 feet, which nobody sits in because it's filled with their storage, right. um, which is fine. Uh, but they don't have a right. Well, when I say it's fine, it's really not quite consistent with the. Do they move the chairs back? Yeah. After the five o'clock or something? Yes, they, 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 they restack them. They take them back along with the What What does the tides do to tell their the people to stay there? What the rules of the road are as far as the uh, use of the beach. Well, the well, they just walk onto the beach and the staff places you. Yeah, the, 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 there's really no right. restriction. There's no restriction on them using the beach. Yeah. But in yeah. terms of using the tides property on the beach, the chairs and so on, is there any communication with the. Uh, with well, the I would imagine. I, 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 yeah. I mean, it's called chairs service. So you nobody, it's there. not self serve. You, you walk out there and walk over to the stand and somebody will take care of you, like you could hotel. I'm sure you show your keys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So do people who are staying in the other resort collection hotels uh, get chairs set up for them as well if you come from uh -huh. Earth yeah. They get dropped off by a bus or they do. drive and over. And, and they... I believe so. Get chairs set up for them. Do so they want to know for sure? So it's exceeding just the capacity of the beach. That's a, that's a great, that's a great it's, point. If we have all of these other hotels coming in here and they all get chairs, then that will vary. Yeah, I don't know what people so the tires get a piece of the action for the money? Well, the same corporation. Same owner. Well, the same owner. They own six hotels. Yeah. Hotels. So if they come and show a piece. Well, the town would just bring an action against the tide and get an injunction. It would take about two minutes. Uh, identify yourself, please. Yeah, uh, so I'm Justin Grimes. I'm with Caleb Ford's Our Collection. So. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. Club can, can answer some of these questions. I wanted to come, obviously, you know, here and listen. I saw it on the on the docket. And I think the original, to your point, the uh, kayak thing was brought up first. Um, I don't know when the last meeting was, but Lori addressed that, I guess, a few months back. So I don't know, to your points about some things improving, I don't know if Chuck, I'm not sure if it's related to that time frame of when the, the issue was before the kayaks were placed. But, um, happy to ultimately walk that with you or anyone else that wants to, to look at the way that those are set up. Um, and, and, and over the years, and again, in my past, I've been here 12 years, I've been on the corner, and I used to run the time, so I know it pretty intimately um, as a general manager as far as you know, things that have been you know, run up in the past as challenges that we work to you know, work through them as we, as we can. Um, but at least on the kayak piece, that's you know that was corrected. I think it was probably June maybe. Uh, but obviously I'm sure it's organic and it's obviously Sprawling, it sounds like so. Again, happy to, to look at that. On the busing comment, so we don't we don't in pond guests go to the tides, but as far as the outside of the collection, that's not that's not happening. Not busting from, from other properties. We do have 
um, you know, over 10 properties, uh, but they're not associated in that way. They're not, they're not going to the beach. To your point about business levels on the beach is, is, is going to be attributed to you know, business demand and business levels, but not because of an additional influx from other properties. So the buses we see are just circulating between the top yeah. and uh, Earth? Exactly. Yep. So well, I in, mean, in, 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 in bond yeah. size. That's yeah. where the that behind. No, no. So they find their own way over. Different numbers. Yeah, yeah. 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 But I'm not sure how they're actually. So how many times would that show because there's a perception that there seem to be more people coming? How many, how many shuttles go? Is it hourly? Is it it's, it's on demand, um, so it's hard to say for certain how many companies specifically there are. But I know in the last, I attended a meeting, I guess it was this past winter when you were presenting about the traffic and, and uh, speeds and such. And you know, I'm engaged in that topic. I want to want to see where that goes because obviously, like I think I said in that meeting, I'm, I'm not even going to know that we're contributing obviously to traffic and to congestion of the beach in terms of our, our, our band. So I want to make sure we can look at that together. But I don't have specific stats on if, if, a, um, if a person is staying at Hotel X, not the Tides, and not uh, in the pond, but he comes over to the Tides, do you give him the chair and do you give him the same rights as if he was at no, the Tides? No, it's just between Hidden Pond and Tides. That's what? Just between Hidden Pond and the Tides. For now. That's that's how it is. That's the policy. That's the, policy. That's the, that's the, policy. That's the policy. Yeah. Um, the van. I, I know. In previous calls, but the van has jersey plates. That's where we, we rented from New Hampshire. People said there's jersey plates coming. We're owned by a company from New York, which is just by chance. But those are them. If you see them, they're out of uh, hooks in New Hampshire. Um, but that's the that's the, the loop that will be happening. But like I said, it's on demand, so we don't have. It's not an hourly hourly option. Um, your question about Ocean Woods was answered correctly. It's it's not an active project right now. But I know in the course of that project, there's a lot of sensitivities around how Ocean Woods would impact the beach. And Ocean Woods would not have access to the tides either. They'd be using the public way just like the public way. Or, or other hotel guests would that are not affiliated with the tides. Can I just ask you a question? How many rooms are there at the tides? And how many rooms are there at Hidden Pond? So uh, the tides has 21 rooms. Okay. And the Hidden Pond has uh, 56. Okay. 56 cottages. So 46 cottages, 56 keys. Three, four people, keys. Upon Come again. three, four people per cottage or whatever the average it, it depends, yeah. So they're broken between three different room types. Some are family cottages that could have four people. Yeah. Um, some are just adults only, which could be yeah, two people. A couple hundred. Exactly. Yeah, so there's 46 structures, 56 hotel rooms. Some of them are convertible, but. Um, well, it's, it's reassuring to hear that it's only coming from. Hidden pond and not elsewhere. There is a Correct. perception of the oh, it. There's a lot, yeah, a lot of perception. <laughs> <laughs> Justin, what controls that? Did that change next year? Come again? What controls that? I believe that had to do with the proceedings around the tides coming into, into our ownership. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't speak you to think that's that coveted somewhere? That might, uh, that might be locked as a as, as a statement, as a rule, that that's all there would be? I'm not, I'm not confident to speak on it, but I, I check with Lori. I know Lori, Lori and I have talked about it in the past. And again, most of my communication comes from Lori, which is sure. great. When, when there's concerns expressed, she brings it to me. Like I said, I live around the corner. We jump on and take a look at it. Um, you know, again, it's there's a lot of human um, behavior in what we do. So, you know, to the questions that you're you're asking about how the beach is is ultimately um, utilized in one one off instance. You know, I, I can't speak to each anecdotal instance, but I'm always happy to to hear complaints, to to walk the beach, to look at it. Um, to understand what the concern How many, how many chairs do you have there available? How many chairs? No. Comes and goes, so we have storage in the garage as well. So, so how many chairs total? Total chair? I couldn't speak yeah. to the exact number of chairs. Approximately, I'd say on any given nature between storage and on the beach, we probably have, I don't know, 80 chairs? Would be my guess. So you, have, you have more than uh, four times the number of rooms? No. Oh, you're speaking for the tides? The tides. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't specifically say how many chairs we have, but my guess would be 80, and if it was 80, it would be you know, just under four times. Yeah. Justin, uh, is there a reason um, the drop-offs can't be on your property? Like, last week, one bus is coming along King, one bus is coming out of both your, both your bus, one larger, yes. described to me by my wife. One was larger than the other. Yeah. I asked her how many, you know. 
she just said, I don't know, one was bigger than the other. Right, yeah. Uh, but, you know, one, so all the traffic was stopped because one, the two of them couldn't pass each other. Right, right. Uh, so what's the... You're saying what, on Belvedere? One, well, one was on Kings trying to turn into Belvedere, yep. and one was coming out of Belvedere, and they, were, they met at the intersection, and it was like negotiating between them to right. decide who was going to, you know, play chicken. Yeah. Uh, which can ha which ha we all know that happens on, on these streets because they're narrow and they're. But my, you know, my question is, uh, you know, is there a reason they can't they can't go into your back lot, drop off on your on private property as opposed to in, in the road? They should. Um, they should be. And I, there's been I mean there's been times over the last decade plus where people have even tried to drop off on Kings Highway and they're slapped with a ticket from the police, which right. is what should, yeah, that's should happen. Right. Um, so that's I mean, it, but are they supposed to come up? Operation is be coming in through the front of the ties, taking a left, turn, dropping people off in the parking lot, and leaving through the back, yeah. and then cutting out. And going to Wildwood and then cutting, cutting down. Exactly. Right. That's that's operationally what is is, is ideal. Um, like I said, they should never be dropping off in the street, and if they do, then the police should, should give them a ticket. And it's, it's happened. Right. Uh, but they should be dropping off in the, in the parking lot. Okay. That's, that's, that's the idea. You know, if, it, if it's, you know, I guess other people would put their hazards on, I'm not sure if that's allowable or not, but it'd be my preference to be dropping off in the parking lot. Um, can you check to see if that's happening? Yeah, uh, because absolutely. I, I, I see them on the side streets, not on the property. Right. But yeah, no, I'm no, not there watching. I, absolutely. No, like I said, these are things that I want to I No, I mean, about. I've seen them stop on Belvedere too many times. Yeah, little kids very common. You see them on Belvedere. Um, Brendan? Uh, it's a very, very interesting zoning question. Whether the tides falls into additional zoning restrictions by generating that many cars. I mean, if he says 23, they should be probably one, one and a half or two for, th for parking space per road. And you just said there's only, you know, 21. 21. You're saying yeah. guest room numbers? No, guest room is 21, so therefore you should, for the, for the tie to the road, mm -hmm. but I, you should be generating, excuse me, you should provide probably 30 or 40 parking spaces, which you don't. And, uh, I don't think there's a complaint. I was going to say, it's the same the with the lock coverage and other things that are going to be in the building. But it's, it's a good question. It's a question for the town if there's a, a yeah, parking concern. It's very interesting to me. question. Anything else? Well, just a clarification. So, so the tides was part of the beach agreement? Yes. Yeah, right. right. They're right. signed. Yet, so they have certain, they have a 25 foot exclusive zone and all of that. Yet, Hidden Pond, even though it's owned by the same people, had nothing to do with the beach agreement, correct? Correct. Right, so yeah. Just the beach agreement. For people saying the Hidden Pond, shuttling them to Goose Rocks, I think, is probably something that's right up front. There's probably a big attraction for them, correct? From a, from a Hidden Pond guest perspective? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The beach is, beach right. Is so, you're now taking advantage of what the ties has as part of the beach agreement, but you get what, twice the people or oh, more yeah. hidden pond. So you're you know taking all of these people and giving them a um, an advantage, let's say, you know, on that uh, or some kind of priority to use that piece of beach where they really have no where, where their facility really has no right to. Is that but, fair? But to your but to the point that was raised. Mm -hmm. The general public can come and sit on that portion of the beach, and they're right. entitled to that as well, just as a guest of hidden ponds. Could either be dropped off and right. left on their own, or, right. or drive themselves and pay for parking and, and sit right. on the beach as well. But, but the way it's set up, you're set up to handle all of those people from hidden ponds, right? Yeah, that's the, that's yeah. hospitality. Yeah. Okay, right. So, so you are using that beach for your own commercial purposes, right? In, in what sense? Well, <laughs> no one in their right mind would stay in huh? get a hidden bond if they couldn't go to Goose Rocks. <laughs> 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 There's nobody saying they can't go to Goose Rocks. Right. <laughs> 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 I 
I think we've lost. I think we've lost the focus of the question. But I, I ultimately hear what you're saying. I think it, it speaks to what John was mentioning about you know the, the town and, and how that is, the history of that. Yeah. Why don't we have John? Back to 2011, as far as how that's John, because this has been in place since 2011. As well. Right. Right. So why don't we find out? None of us are really aware of what that understanding agreement was between the town and uh, Tim Harrington at the time um, with respect to um, taking people from Hidden Pond and bringing them. So, John, if you could add that to your list. Talk to Larry about it. I'm sure she. Not, not just Hidden Pond, but also the other pond. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, that, to yeah. really if there's an agreement that it's limited to Hidden Pond for That's some reason, yeah. 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 And if not, we should carve that into stone. That would be a recommendation from us, I would assume. Yeah. Because my point is, visually, it gives the impression of an exclusive zone. Mm -hmm. Because of all the chairs and the umbrella, everything's the same thing. And, and, and people sweep the seaweed off to the sides. You know? So again, you're, why are they grooming that area that they have no right to? They have every right, right to it. I, 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 don't, do. I don't understand there's no right, right to it. Right. No right to it? Well, why do you feel they have no right to it? Well, if they go into the public part of the beach, beyond their 25 feet, yeah. all right, and now you start grooming it and putting yeah. your chairs in there. Well, you only put the chairs if someone has come to use a chair, right? right. You certainly should not put your chairs out there to market to exclude people from sitting. Is that the practice? We didn't know you were here when we had that. Yeah. No, I understand. Yeah. Uh, you're saying which practice? The, the practice uh, customer comes. Uh, and they, they, they need a chair, they get, they get a chair. Correct. They're not 40 chairs out there waiting. You don't for put 20 chairs out at 8, 8 a.m. in the morning to march the spot. You used to do more. Yeah, we used, we used to. But no used to. Correct, yes. yeah, it's not, that's not correct. The correct practice is to put them out when guests, we don't want to sit, they choose what they want to sit. The, the, the raking, we rake our area, we put the seaweed in the, in the beach grass, and that, that occurs. But uh, we're not grooming the beach to, to delineate. I mean, we've had people come in and you know, people delineate what we have, right? People stuff their shoe on what our line would be, but we're not delineating that from a sweeping perspective. Just so it might not be your intention, but you are. If you create that line of seaweed, it's not, it's and not a delineation to, but you're saying to, it's not to keep people out. So. Yeah, but I'm saying visually, it gives that impression. If, if that's so, the perception. I guess my only other suggestion is in terms of staff training, if people are telling people they can't sit in that area, they need to be trained. Or, uh, of course, absolutely. So if you could give us that commitment, that would be great. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Thank you. Like I said, any, anything that, that occurs, please, I don't know how best to get my contact or I know Kate knows and she's reached out over the years, uh, which has been really productive, but happy to have any of those conversations. Because again, a lot of these things, even in this course of the conversation, a lot of it's you know um, anecdotal and, and certainly occurring, and a lot of it is, is you know, people's perception of it. So I want to make sure we cut to the chase of what's occurring and what's not and, and fix things that are occurring and things that we don't want to have occurring. Like, so I'm just as engaged and live around the corner and grew up here and want to make sure this is productive for everyone. So I, I, I genuinely want to make sure this is, you know, addressed and taken care of. Brendan? Did I, excuse me, did I hear you say that you rate the beach, your portion of the beach, and you put the sea weed in the seagrass? Correct. That affects the flavors. <laughs> the seaweed is supposed to help regenerate the beach grass. I think the DEP, I could be wrong on this, I think the DEP says if you break uh, the grass, the only thing you can do is take it to the water, put it in the water. They do not allow, even though, of course, it would seem to be beneficial to, uh, particularly on the edge. Um, but I don't think, I think that's technically a DEP. That's educational. Uh, I can send you. Uh, John, what are you, what are you saying? Okay. I, have, I got another thing about parking. I'm just put, put on, finish, finish this discussion. Okay. Well, you're talking about the, the seaweed. There, I sent a thing a year or so ago now where the piles of seaweed along the beach are beneficial for the plovers because they get a lot of insects and things in them. And that's where they feed. Yeah, I love it. I'll see if I can find that. There's just a lot of it there too. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, that's not an operational practice that we're putting it in, but I've heard over them for being here that CUE benefits yeah. regenerate the village efforts. So I'm not saying that's our, it's not in our handbook as far as how we each other is supposed to put CUE. I'm just saying it. Well, my wife puts it in their garden, so I <laughs> it seems to work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Anything else on this before we 
I got one thing on parking, just, just something heads up for further discussion sometime in the future. This past week, first time ever, we got a call. Somebody wanted to leave their car on our property and they're willing to pay 250 bucks a week. So they could use money. We said, of course, absolutely not. <laughs> but just something that keep thinking about in the future. They could have bought it. Somebody said, "Come on, right?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I got to find a spot. Uh, yeah. That's the real but problem. <laughs> just, just a potential problem coming. Somebody take a lot and make a parking place out of it. Mm -hmm. Not allowed in the zone. Okay. No. The uh, campground tried that years ago. So. Okay. Stop. Um, okay. The only other item we have as a committee is to decide when our next meeting is. Uh, we need a meeting in September. Can we wait till October? Uh, any preferences? <coughs> what? I think we could go for October. October 24th is the 3rd. No, the 17th is the 3rd. Uh, that's our official date that we have space for. So let's do it on the uh, 17th. Thank you, Carol. And uh, that will not be at the firehouse, that'll be at the other fire. Yes, that'll be back. Thank you, John. That'll be back in town. Um, can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Thank you, John. Thank you, Van. All in favor? Aye. All right. Thank you. And uh, now the official meeting is over, and we have a special guest. Ed Hutchins had volunteered back when he was on this committee yes. <laughs> to. Uh, Tom, give us a, a little uh, talk on lobstering in uh, Maine, and uh, he's a fifth generation lobsterman. Um, he's also uh, a guest chair of our Board of Selectmen this year. Yep, uh, that's me. He was a very loyal attender of our meeting. Take your corner, John. Uh, Thank you. This is uh, Ed's PowerPoint here. Yes. I brought some notes because I promised. As somebody who has to attend several meetings a year, um, I, I'm not a fan of pontification and extra long meetings. So I promise, uh, Paul, I'd be brief tonight. I used to do this back about 15, 20 years ago. I used to uh, meet with groups of tours down at Cape Orpus Pier uh, from the mid Midwest and the West Coast and talk to them for about an hour about lobstering. So, I haven't done it in quite a while, but uh, I promise that uh, I'll cut things down a little bit tonight and leave a little opportunity for hopefully some Q&A at the end. So as Paul said, I'm Ed Hutchins. Uh, I'm a fifth generation lobster in my family, has lived continuously in Cape Orpus since at least 1761. That's as far back as I can trace uh, the Hutchins family, and I know my mother's family, the Fishers. Uh, probably go back just about as far, and as their name suggests, they were fit lobstermen and fishermen themselves. Sadly, my grandfather Fisher passed away when I was very young, so I didn't get an opportunity to know him as well as I did my grandfather Hutchins, whom I was named after. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to go lobstering with him, and that was infinitely more fun than going with my dad, because my dad used to make me work. My grandfather let me run the boat and haul the traps. And, you know, and when we got home, my grandmother would make us a big lunch. That was the best part, because he lived right, he walked out his front door, walked across Langston Road, got in his boat, we rowed out to his lobster boat, and away we went, you know, the good old days. Um, so, day in the life of a, of a lobsterman, I used to get up about, 4.30 in the morning, first thing I do is go hit the coffee maker, turn on the news, catch the news, get the weather for the day to see if there's any updates, um, make my lunch. Um, I should note that I drink my coffee out of a very nice Goose Rocks Beach coffee mug that was given to me for my year of service to the Goose Rocks Beach Advisory Committee. Um, so I, my dad's been lobstering with me this year. It's been hard to get help. Um, I had a kid with me, a high school kid. He's um, really, really smart kid, and go, wants to go to MIT, so he goes to the STEM school up in Limestone. So they started classes this week, so they start a little earlier. But uh, my dad is 79, and he still lobsters on his own, but he chose not to this year, so he said, well, I'll help you out. So he's been going. So I run up the street, he lives just up the street from me, and uh, pick him up, and we get down the pier about 6 in the morning, and put the bait out, and I go down and get the boat, and we load it up, and uh, we head out the harbor. 
Uh, we usually haul between 150 and 200 traps a day. And these, these are my experiences. If you, if you travel up and down the coast, I mean, there's over 5,000 lobstermen in Maine. The fishing conditions and the boat size and the catch per trap is, is different in different parts of the state. Uh, the further down the coast you go, the better the fishing gets as a rule. But it's still good here. You, know, you still make a decent living here if you want to put your time in. Uh, so we pick up the bait, and that's uh, pogies. They come in a big blue 55-gallon drum put up by uh, Cape Corpus Lobster Company. Uh, they deli deliver right to the pier, put it in my bait space. And uh, When I started lobstering, the bait was herring predominantly. But, uh, they kind of got fished out. We told the federal government when they allowed it was called midwater trawling for these fish that this was a bad idea. Basically, took a 120-foot boat and dragged the big net behind and caught all the fish. Whereas traditionally, uh, herring and and to this day, pogies are caught with a purse seine, where you might have a 60-foot boat. You might even have a 100-foot boat, but you'd have about a 20, 25-foot boat behind it, and they'll pull a net off the back of the boat and they'll, they'll see the big schools of fish. I mean, you can see them, I'm sure. Anybody who's been to Goose Rocks and seen the flapping in the, on a calm day, those are pogies, those aren't stripers. Those are pogies out there. So and is a Mayhaden, is that Yes, Mayhaden, Bunker, uh, yeah. pogies, the colloquial are term here. Are they food here. fish at all or just bait fish, basically? What's are that? they food fish at all? Oh, no, you food wouldn't food want fish. to eat them. No, 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 they're very bony and they're very, very oily. They're, uh, I heard a uh, PhD referred to them as like the protein bar of the ocean. Basically, <laughs> Every, everything eats them. Uh, but they were only down south. I, mean, I never knew them. Well, they've been here, yeah, but they have well, expanded there. In, in they, not in my 70 year age. Being, right? Well, they didn't have stripers here when I was a kid, and people say they're native to me. Well, we had them. But, come back, and it, but anyways, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you know, when I started, we used the, um, the, the herring, and they were $20 a barrel. The barrel's a little bit smaller than a the drums that we use today. So today, for a, a drum of pogies, is two hundred and sixty dollars a drum. Wow. We'll go through a drum a day. Last year it was one hundred and sixty dollars. So the um, supply chain, the, the inflation, has really caught up with us between the fuel and the bait. And we've got to go to Hamilton Marine to buy anything, and it's twenty to sixty percent more. But it's life of a small business. We had one of our best years. We, I had my best year last year. We were getting an unreal amount of fruit. The lobsters, so you know, take the good with the bad. Uh, so we'll go out and we'll haul our 150 traps a day. Now, now this trap here, it's obviously wood. It's an antique. It was actually made by an old lobsterman when I was uh, in my 20s. It was a lamp. I never really liked the lamp, but I thought the trap was cool, so I disassembled it. But the traps, they work the same way as, as I work. Go through my lecture here. I'll, I'll explain how how they work, but. Um, we have them set up as singles, so where you see one buoy, like when, you're, when you see them off the beach, those are singles. You got one buoy, a vertical line, and a trap. So it, it takes a long time because you've got about 120 feet of rope, 20 fathoms, and you have to haul each one up individually. Today we were hauling triples, so for each buoy, and they'd be bigger buoys because we fish them out in deeper water, uh, we would have three traps tied together. Uh, on Saturday, we were hauling trawls where we have 10 traps tied together between two buoys. That's in federal waters. You're not allowed to fish the 10 trap trawls in state waters. In certain parts of the state, you are, but not in this particular area. Uh, they're good because you can haul a lot of gear in a day on 10 trap trawls or 20s. Some guys fish 20s. It, and those are part of these whale regulations. They required us to tie more traps together to reduce the, the end lines. Uh, if you go to Casco Bay, they all fish multiple trap trawls in there. And those guys will haul 400 traps in a day. Sometimes they'll say, they can't, no, they're not getting out. They'll haul all 800 of them in one day, which is a phenomenal. Are they bigger boats that are necessary? Not necessarily, no. Not, not in the bay, no. But they ha usually have their sterns cut out, or they have a, a trap table, so they'll set all the traps on their side in a, in a row, and what you do is the, the captain or one of the sternmen will push the first one over, and they're all tied together, and they'll shoot right out the back of the boat. The fishermen are pretty resilient and, and pretty, uh, pretty effective at, at you know, maximizing the, the time that they spend on, on the ocean. To, we have a saying, if, if the hauler's not turning, you're not earning. So, you 
know, you gotta you gotta make the most of your time out there. Uh, the typical, you know, people often ask me where you put your traps. Well, it depends on the time of the year. In the springtime, uh, normally up on the hard bottom, uh, and you know, because the the bottom of the ocean looks similar in topography as the as the land does. You know, it's not all flat by any means, and. In the springtime, the lobsters like to be up in the shallower water, and shallow is a relative term. I mean, you could be out on Jeffries and it's 600 feet here, and you go a half a mile over there, and it's 140 feet. So, shallow would be relative to off of Goose Rocks Beach, where inside the the eastern and the western Goose Rocks, as as we call it, you know, where the boats are moored, and you sometimes you see the traps. It, it's 10 feet there. But as the lobsters shed and they molt, they, they like to get into the colder waters. So we start putting them down into the gullies. Like on, if you go out to Timber Island, you can see that all the traps just kind of follow along the buoys in a, in a line. That's because that's where the deeper water is in that area. And, uh, and it makes a big difference. If you catch in two or three lobsters to a trap down here in the in the gully and you accidentally get one up on top, you'll know right away because usually what you'll see is instead of the shedders, the soft shell, shiny lobsters, you'll catch the old hard shells and the female uh, egg bearing lobsters, etc. And those aren't, aren't really what we're looking for, you know, because they've been picked over pretty hard at that point. And people ask me, you know, how many can you catch in a trap? I once caught 13 lobsters in the western goose rocks. It was so shallow, I think, when the trap stood up, it hit the bottom of the boat. <laughs> I mean, that place is full of lobsters. That What's happened is it's a nursery, and uh, I was doing research for the state for years where we had these special traps, and we'd haul them, and they didn't have vents, the little escape, the little circles or rectangles that you see in the traps themselves uh, clipped into them. And those let the juvenile lobsters out. And you want them to get out because these traps will fill right full of little lobsters. And then the bigger lobsters tend not to go in after them. You know, they, the little ones tend to gang up on the big ones, believe it or not. Uh, but in the goose rocks, we were catching 70 to 80 lobsters per trap. Oh my God. That's, that's what I said. I've never seen so many. Oh but none of them were any bigger than that. Yeah. But that's a good sign. I mean, that means the water's yeah. clean, it's healthy. The lobsters uh, feel good about that. And you know those little lobsters will eventually grow up to be bigger lobsters. I was recently you were getting. That. Oh, that was probably ten years ago okay. that I was doing it. But I would be willing to. I'd be willing to bet there's still a substantial sure. amount of lobsters in there. You know, one of the things that we hear um, is climate change and all the lobsters are moving down east. That's that's not true. The, yeah, what's happened is the lobster population has spread out across the Gulf of Maine as it's warmed up. It's not that there are less lobsters here today than there were. In fact, there are more lobsters in this area and in any part of the coast today than when I started 30 years ago. Are they starting to disappear any place for yourself? Yes. Yeah, they're having problems, but they are, I mean, it's hard to compare southern New England to the Gulf of Maine. Yeah. Southern New England is a bathtub. I mean, you have to go. Well, we'll think of it this way. We've all been to the beach. I, I don't go as much as before, but when I was a kid, we used to get out of Dingy Point, right to the right. The water would just lay there and it was shallow, and you'd go in and it'd be like being in a bathtub. But then you go down to the river and you jump in, and it was cold because the water was deeper and it was moving down there. And you know, we didn't swim down there as much. And so, southern New England, the, you can go 10, 15 miles from shore, and it's still 10 fathoms, 60 feet of water. You can't go out to the, you know, the gully that runs out by Timber Island runs out to 120 feet. You know, it's, it's quite deep. And as you, as you go out further, I mean, the Gulf of Maine is 600 feet deep. So, yes, they say the Gulf of Maine is warming, and, and I don't doubt that it isn't because just the, the way the lobsters have moved and their migration patterns and the way we catch them has changed in the, in the 30 years that I've been doing this. Uh, you know, the, when I started, Everybody fished single gear. Everybody fished up around. You could walk on the buoys. There were so many. Exactly. Now, about half of the fleet just fishes, you know, 10, 20 miles offshore, and they stay out there year round. You would have starved to death 30 years ago out there. So, so the, the lobsters would have been there in the winter, or in late fall, but they wouldn't have been there in the summertime. 
So the lobster population has definitely expanded. I mean, the sad thing about the, uh, the, the warming of the Gulf of Maine is, you know, what the Gulf of Maine giveth, the Gulf of Maine will eventually take it away from us. You know, eventually it will get too warm. Hopefully not in my lifetime. I figure I got another 20 years doing this. I'll be, you know, maybe 25 years. I'll be 80 then. And it might be time to call it quits. You know, most lobstermen here go. I mean, and that's what I want to do. You know, I enjoy this. I, I have a bachelor's degree in political science. Would you like fries with that? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I went, I went to college, got my degree, didn't have any money to pay for it, joined the army, got out, worked for a big corporation, woke up one morning and said, well, I didn't spend four years in college. I didn't sign up for the military for six years to pay for that college to be told what to do the rest of my life. So I quit, came back to Maine. And, that's why I have been doing this for the last maybe 30 years um, next year. started as an adult in 1993. Um, but when I started, it was easy to get, a, to get a license. You just send in your $93 to the state and they sent you a license. Today, it's, I think my lobster license is $1,200. But that's, that's for me and a helper and 800 trap tags. Because we have to, they didn't have trap tags when they started. The, the trap limit was unlimited. Now it's 800. And it, when this whale thing is done, it will probably be less. But that's one of the things that I kind of think is a silver lining. Because I think we have too many traps. The price, the cost of doing business in lobstering has is, is gotten kind of out of hand, as I, as I alluded to earlier. Bait, uh, fuel, et cetera, et cetera. A trap, you know, one of those wire traps that we have. Used to be a hundred bucks. Now they're two hundred dollars, and, and I mean, and they vary. They're like cars. You know, some people have small ones. Some people have five footers. You know, most common is a four footer, which is what I use. But you know, the, the price of them. Apparently, a lot of steel came from uh, the Ukraine. So the price of the the, the metal, or the, we call it wire. Most of it's made in Riverdale, Massachusetts, and in a place in in Italy, uh, shot through the roof. So. Uh, you know, we having a trap reduction. Although, if you say that to some people, you know, I mean, that that's heresy to even suggest that to a lot of people. But I think in the end, we would do better. The Canadians only have a 350 trap limit. And I've been to Canada and met with their fishermen. Spent a week up there at a fisheries conference, and they all think we're crazy for, for fishing so much. Kate, did you have a question? Question: When you, when you, when you when John mentioned about. You could probably walk before you mentioned there were so many lobster traps and buoys out there. Goose rocks. And goose rocks. Everywhere. Forever. But is there some sort of territorial area? Like, so, you, can you go out and just put your so any lobster From a legal place? perspective, there are territorial limits. So I am I have to stay within zone G, which is roughly, which is from the New Hampshire border up until about Cape Elizabeth. If I want to fish outside of my home zone, then I need to buy a tag an additional tag, because you can only fish 49% of your traps outside of your home zone. But nobody from zone G fishes in zone F. The guys from zone F, which is Casco Bay, do fish here, but mostly outside. And then if I want to fish beyond the three mile limit, I need to have a federal lobster permit, which I have. Um, and I was fortunate enough to get it for free. Uh, they've been as high as $50,000. Those are transferable. Lobster licenses from the state are not. But just within, say, you know, our little area here. Well, yes. I mean, if you go so far to the river, and whatever, and but, the but as far as anybody from Cape Orpheus, let's just say they can fish in this area. Yeah. Any of us can fish. So we don't say we don't like you. You can't fish over here. So you uh, can drop your buoys or your traps wherever. anywhere within the anywhere within what we would consider Cape Orpheus territory. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, but that's not the case everywhere. Some some places have. I understand they have family. Areas where yeah, this family, only this family fishes yeah, here, and then wow. they, yeah, and then they fight over the place. In the yeah, that's yeah. what I was wondering. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully that yeah. No, not so, not so much here. Uh, now, in order to get a license today, you have to go through an apprenticeship program, which is two. The the basic gist of it is two years mm -hmm. and two hundred days at sea, and you have a little log book, and you fill it out, and the Marine mm -hmm. Patrol checks it, and when you're done, you have to go to a safety course boaters, not, not so much boater safety, but life saving, um, which I think is, is a wise thing. I told my the 
kid that was with me, he's now eligible for his license. I said, when you sign up to go, I said, I, I've never done the program because I didn't have to, but I said, I'll, I'll pay for us and, and I'll go with you because I think it's a good idea. Um, even though he must be an aeronautical engineer, and he's more than capable of doing that, but I think that he's worked for me and he's had his opportunity. I think he, I said, you, you'd be remiss if you didn't get your license because once you're an adult, forget it. So if you're under 23 and a full-time student, when you finish that program and you finish your certification, the state says, here's your lobster license. You get 300 tags and you can build up 100 per year till you reach your zones maximum, because there is one zone that only has 600. Um, if you're over 23, you're screwed. I, no, wait a minute. Yeah, you go on a waiting list until you're about 100, and then they'll give you a license. Right? Yeah, it's about 10 or 15 years. It's an exit ratio of five to one, and it's based yeah. on trap tags, so 800 times five, um, that, that's a lot of trap tags out, because as guys retire, like my dad, who used to have six, 800 tags, he's worked his way down, so he only has a couple hundred, because he's more doing it as, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's like being a farmer, it's a, it's a lifestyle. It's, it's not an occupation, it's, it, it consumes everything. There's never a day I don't ride by, go to the harbor, there's another day I'm not out painting the weeds or working in my shop, it's not a day I drive by a flagpole and look to see which way the wind's blowing. And you don't even think of these things. I remember one year I brought all my traps up and I wasn't fishing in the winter and I would drive around and it was always dark in the winter time and you see the light, it pulls and I'm like, I'm to get out tomorrow. I'm like, wait a minute, I don't have to go tomorrow. And you, and you pick up on these things and you don't even realize you're doing it. But it's, uh, yeah, Paul. Um, I'm interested in the, uh you know, who do you sell to? Oh, and, sure. And um, and when do you sell? Do you hold them? Yeah, that's a the that's price? a good question. Yeah, we're, we're about at that point. So at the end of the day, we come in and hopefully the tank is full, holds about six hundred pounds. That's always a good day. I mean, in as we get towards the end of the year, you know, we'll fill that tank and we'll have four or five crates on top of that. Um, but. We come in and if you've been to Cape Corpus, you see those little floats out in the harbor with looks like little outhouses on them. Those are the buying stations. So you pull up there because you're not allowed. We don't unload our lobsters at the pier because it takes time to take the lobsters out of the tank and put them in the crate. And if we were doing that at the pier, nobody would ever get done at the end of the day. So we pull up to these lobster cars, as they're called, and we take our lobsters and we put them in crates, they weigh them up 90 pounds and then stack the crates up, they, they count up the crates, do the math, and give me a slip with my name on it, and it'll say Edo, that's my nickname, and uh, you got to have a nickname and a dog, well I don't have a dog anymore, and, and maybe a pickup truck or a boat, uh, but you got to have a nickname, and so they write my name on the slip and how many pounds I had, and at the end of the week, um, you know, the, the guy at the at the Cape Horps Lobster Company, does the math and adds up the slips. And I go in and he gives me a check and then he gives me a bait bill for the week and hopefully the check's bigger than the bait bill. I've seen weeks where it wasn't, but usually it is. Uh, and and that, that's pretty much how the operation goes. Uh, so you I, can't I, hold it off the market? I, I mean, you could. I, my license is I can sell lobsters to anybody. I mean, I could set up on my front lawn and within the ordinance of the town, I could sell lobsters. Sure. But it would just be... Uh, it'd be a lot of work. Yeah, it would, no, I, I read like in the Portland Press that uh, you know, when, when that, that people were holding, you know, not going out or were holding them off the market until the price. Yeah, well, you know, a while back. That that's kind of like playing roulette. Left, you bet. Yeah, yeah. That's. I mean, you can. You, you certainly could, but I don't see that the price is going to go up anytime soon. You know, this year we're. And we're in an inflationary period, there's too much money in the economy, and people are choosing between filling up their tanks and, and uh, buying groceries or buying lobster, and I don't, you know, I, I don't fault them, you know, you, you need to put gas in your tank, lobster's a luxury item. Yeah. Yeah. What are the boats you see late in the evening? Those, those, you know, I, I don't know because I'm usually asleep at that time. <laughs> probably in the summer, those are probably tuna boats, tuna tuna fishermen. Yeah, they've had a hard year too. I guess tuna fish is cheaper than they get paid less than what you can buy it for in a can over at Market Basket. Wow. And when I started lobstering, I would say back in the early '90s, when the Japanese economy was really strong, because all the tuna, all the bluefin tuna, go to Japan. 
they were getting fifty dollars a pound. I mean, that wasn't that was a high price, but they were probably averaging thirty dollars a pound thirty years ago, and now they're averaging on a good year ten. So, so why is that? Uh, well, the Japanese don't have the money they used to. Yeah. And you know, and, and everything's just more expensive. You know? Supply and demand, right? Just, well, yeah, and and again, all that goes to Japan. I mean, I don't know why. You know, it's plenty of great. I love sushi. There's plenty of great sushi restaurants in Portland, and yeah. you know, in the area that you could probably buy these. But I mean, you're talking five, six hundred pound fish. fish. That's that, a lot of fish. That that's a lot of sashimi. Yeah. <laughs> Although I'm, I'm willing to try to eat my share of it. <laughs> well, it has become so much more popular fish. Yes. I mean, and when I was yeah. growing up. Came out of a can exactly, <laughs> Charlie. Sorry, yeah. Charlie. Right? Yeah. Exactly. yeah. I said that to my stern man one day. Me, let me see. Like, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. Um, so some other rules that we have to follow. Um, there's no Sunday lobstering in the summertime. That's why you don't see us out. Don't ask me why. It's just it's one of those. Hey, Dad, why is it that way? I don't know. It's always been that way. So I guess it's, it always will be that way. Um, starting in September, we'll be able to go seven days a week again. Um, we have a V-notch protection, which is one of the reasons why Maine, in particular, has had such a robust fishery. So, whenever I catch a lobster, a couple things. First thing I do is measure it. I brought one of my measures. I got a three and a quarter side, and a five inch side. So, Maine's always had a double gauge. It's always we had a minimum size and we had a maximum size to protect breeder lobsters. And I do. I just in the last two days out, I probably caught ten. 12 oversized lobsters. Wow. And there's even more of those out there, but the traps are not designed for those giant lobsters. You don't want them in there because they plug everything up and you can't get anything by them. Uh, but but there's a lot of them out there. I mean, Trawlers we usually pull those off the bottom, right? Yeah, we pull them off, yeah. yeah. Well, they, or they get caught in gill nets, etc. Yeah. But there's there's a lot of them out there. But we also have a V-notch. So after I determine if the lobster is a legal size, I flip it over and check the sex of it. Male lobsters have two V-shaped flippers closest to their abdomen. Females have much more delicate and, and most often crossed little flippers. And if it's a female, well, you know, if it's got eggs, I can see it right away. So I check to see if it's got a V-notch in its right middle flipper. If it does, I throw it back over. If it doesn't, you know, I'll cut a notch in it. But if it doesn't have eggs and it's female, then I check the flipper, that flipper to see if there's a V-notch in it. If it's notched, the flipper is missing or it's mutilated in any way that would obscure a V, it goes over and it's protected until they will shed those those <coughs> notches out eventually. I see. So you, you uh because you could eat if you find a female lobster that has roe, so that wasn't illegally caught. You don't have to throw back. No, well, so we don't know there's roe inside of them. But I brought some home the other day, and there's always, they're yeah. either on the inside or on the outside. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but when we see them, it looks like blackberries stuck that. to the bottom yeah. of their abdomen, of their tail. Not their abdomen, of their tail. And you can't keep those. In the 1880s, that was a, considered a delicacy, and it spread it on toast in England. It, they almost wiped out the lobster fishery yeah. up to about 19. The thing that really saved it was the fishery was so small compared to what it was to, today. It wasn't in... It's it's slightly industrialized to this point. You know, I have a 37 foot boat with a 400 horse engine in it, and when I launched it 20 years ago, it's brand new, and it was one of the biggest and fastest boats in Cape Corpus Harbor. It's neither today, not by a long shot. Yeah. And you go down east, and they're launching 50 million dollar boats, yeah. but they catch a lot more lobsters than we do. You said if it's if it's a female, no visible eggs. Do you have and a keeper? Do you have to notch it or do no, you keep it? No, no. I misunderstood. Only, only if it has that notch in it. So if it has eggs on it and no notch, you notch it. If it has no eggs and a notch, you throw it overboard. Because it no, had eggs. Some correct. Others. So the notch just implies that it has been caught as a breeder and that is just a like a brand on it. So but next protected. year it's going to lose the notch. Every time no, it no, it doesn't. No, it won't. Oh. It, it takes several years to shed them out. Fascinating. It's smaller I, each time yeah, as they shed. Yeah. Fascinating. Absolutely. Uh, and one of the other things that the state of Maine does is they have a sea sampling program. They have a ventless trap program, and that's what I was alluding to earlier when I said we've caught the 70, 80 lobsters in the western goose rocks in each trap. And that's a state-run program, and they send out people with you. They tell you where to set the traps. And then somebody comes and records the depth, the 
the day that you hauled the traps, how many lobsters were in, what kind of bait, how long they sat, etc. And then there's also a voluntary, I got paid for that one, then there's also a voluntary program. I got this free hat for doing that. <laughs> but, but it's very important, they've been doing it since the 50s or 60s. So, and I've done it every year with the exception of the first year of COVID because my dad was going and I didn't want to bring strangers onto the boat. Um, but they do the same thing, but they, every trap I haul, I take all the lobsters out and throw it in the banding tray. And then they measure them and throw all, and, and check the sex, the carapace length in centimeters. I don't know, I'm not much for the metric system, but you know, in some sort of metric of uh, how long they are and in recording the conditions of them and then they throw them all back with the exception of the lobsters that I can keep and then I get to keep like I normally would. Uh, and then they record all that data. So they build out quite a database in knowing what's going on in the ocean, which is good. And the last thing uh, I told you, the traps, they look different but the function of them hasn't changed any, you know. Basically, these little nets are called heads, and the, the bait hangs here, either in a bag, or this one has a little string on it where they put it on off with a baiting iron, and the lobster comes in and eats the bait, and then 97% of all the lobsters go right back out. They've hooked cameras to these things. There's a, a PhD at UNH who has some video, and I've watched this. It's pretty fascinating. I mean, it's it's kind of depressing when you see all the things in and out. But but it's good because if we were to keep all the lobsters that went in, you know, we would wipe out, or, or we'd do a number on the on the on the population itself. Uh, so the lob the dumb lobsters, I guess, they go in into the back. So this is called the kitchen, the front, and this is called the parlor. And the big traps that I have now are double parlors, so there's just two heads. And once the lobster's in the parlor, you know, he's pretty well stuck in there. And then he's just waiting for me or she for me to come by and take them out and measure them and check to make sure that they're legal or sublegal. And if they're legal, they go in the tank and end up on your dinner plate. And if they're illegal, they go over until they're legal. So I think. Well, so they, so this funny thing, so last, last year, sitting in there drinking coffee in the morning, watching the TV with my wife before I'm going out, and on the news, cotton candy lobster caught in Casco Bay. <laughs> and they show a picture, I'm like, hmm. And then the story comes on, rare, one in 10 million, I'm like, bullshit. I caught a lobster just like that last week, pulled out my phone and showed my wife the picture of it. <laughs> So, I don't know, maybe I should have bought a lottery ticket. <laughs> but uh, they have interesting, I caught a, well, they don't call it a hermaphrodite. I don't even know you can say that anymore. There's no woke people in this audience. So I might be in trouble. Uh, no woke lobsters. No woke lobsters. A hermaphrodite lobster it had one, and I'm not making this up. You can Google this, it really yeah. happens. And one male, you know, like I said, you look at the, and, the, and one female. female, yeah. And so I told somebody this, and then the story got around, and then the story, it's like when you were a kid, you played telephone in grade school, and the story, so the story came back that it had one half of its abdomen had eggs on it, and the other half didn't, so it's like, okay. I'm like, all right, all right. But uh, yeah, they do exist. Apparently, they are not, um, they are one sex or the other. They just present both of the, the, those flippers, but I don't know. I, um, you know, unless you're another lobster, that's really the only definitive way I know to tell male from female. What's the biggest yeah. lobster you ever got? Well, so again, that's kind of limited by the size of the trap. So in a real trap, these side heads, these funnel hoops, because these trap, these heads are shaped like funnels if you look at them. They're big on one end and <coughs> narrow on the other. Uh, and the sides are only seven inches. So, you know, six pounds maybe, tops. But I mean, there's certainly bigger ones. My dad's told me, so I've only been a lobsterman. My dad has been a gill netter, a shrimper. He's worked on uh, ground fish, dragging boats. He's, you know, he's been lobstering since he was 12, etc. But he said when they would go gill netting and dragging, it wasn't unusual to catch one that was, you know, like 20 pounds. Yes. Not on everyday occurrence, but they would catch them. And of course, they're, the bigger lobsters, you know, are further from shore as a rule. But um, there, there's some big ones out there. For sure. And you said like you're out on the water at like 6 a.m. which yes. makes me just cringe. Um, at least but it's warm this time of year. When do you when do you what, I mean, 
what's the typical date when you come back in? And I'm also, usually in about one o'clock. Well, then my father says he's in a union now, so I have to have him home by noon. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he was telling all his friends today. <laughs> so we can figure out when it's safe to go down, and we might find parking down here. Yeah, then, yeah, yeah. We're, well, well, and the boats come in at various times. I mean, yeah. some of those boats that are going offshore, especially in the fall and the winter, they got an hour and a half, two hours steam just yeah. to get to their first trap. And how late? How late uh, are you? Most lobstermen work in the year, like in the year round. Winter? Yeah, it's a year, year lobstering year is a year round. It is, but I, I've decided between the we're going to tear down Cape Orpus Pier and yeah. do it this winter, and the low price that I think that I'm going to be done by Christmas. Yeah. My wife's got a pretty big honeydew list around the house yeah. that I'm yeah. getting to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's be brutal out there on the yeah. Though. Either both of you. How often do you have to check your traps? Uh, well, I you know, I'd like to check them every four or five days, but the weather doesn't always accommodate that. But once a week at least. The law says every thirty days, but you wouldn't make much money if that's how you right. operated. And this summer has been fairly good as far as weather goes. Yeah, it's been good. Yeah, we haven't had too many storms or anything that would keep you. No, on no, we're watching this one on Wednesday. That they're talking possible wind, but I think it's going to go outside of us. I mean. Yeah. Become a, over 30 years of watching the weather every day, I've become a pretty good meteorologist myself. I mean, most fishermen are. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you, you watch, and I mean, they'll talk about stuff, and I'll be like, well, you got low here, low here, low here, high here, and the gestures are like, full of crap. That is not going to happen. <laughs> and my wife just shakes her head. <laughs> so earlier you mentioned something about new regulations to protect whales. What was that? Oh, we don't have another hour to talk about all this. But, but, yeah, we, we look like, my, my stand on that is, the, the, what are they asking you to do? They basically go out of business is what they'd like us to do. They want us to go to rope fishing. That's like going to tireless vehicles. It is, it's just stupid. And it's, it's unnecessary. There are places where there are lobster traps and whales, like Pod Bay, the islands around there. Canada, as, as I said earlier, as the Gulf of Maine has warmed up, the coca pods, I think that's what they're called, these little crustaceans that float around in the water column. That's, the, that's what our giant right whale eats, these little tiny minuscule things. And they've all moved, they've, they've migrated into colder Canadian water where the you know, outside of the Gulf of Maine. Uh, I recently looked at a, a map of all the right whale sightings in the, basically York County over the last 10 years. And there might be 10 dots on there. I'm looking, going, well, that's a lot. And then you start looking at the dates and you realize that it, in at least four cases, it was the same whale because they saw it in Wells, you know, today, and then they saw it off of York on Friday. So, most likely the same way. As I said, my father's been doing this 60 years. He said he's never, over 60 years, that he's never seen a, a, a right whale. You know, I've never seen one. I've seen Mickey's. I actually saw a humpback once uh, off of Fortune's Rocks, about um, two or three miles. It scared the crap out of me. Yeah. Thing, it was a mile, it was at least a mile, a mile and a half away, and that thing just went boom. I thought it was a submarine breach. It was massive. <laughs> but it seems to only be the right whales that get wound up in lobster trees. In rope, you know, they're the only ones that are have issues. The the, the the bigger whales, they don't. The minkies certainly don't. And there hasn't been a documented kill. There's never been a documented kill in the state. And we've been marking our rope. We've been doing all of these things. But it's, this isn't about whales. This is about money. I think they might find their match. These NGOs, though, because now I see they're going after the shipping companies, and the shipping companies have a lot more money. We've done well. We have. We're kind of like the Ukraine of the um, <laughs> of the. Um, you know the the political uh, the uh, the legal arena because we fought back a lot harder than these people thought we would and, and we might actually win. I mean, we're not going to win. There's not going to be any winners in this. Trust me. You know, uh, but we might actually get to stay in business. We might survive. We might yeah. survive. Yeah. You know, in fact, if we have to take a lower trap limit, there'll definitely be some grumbling and some crying and some I'm going to go out of business. But probably that won't happen in the long run. Some people will probably say, well, geez, we should have done this 20 years ago. But um, do I have any more questions?
Knowing how physical your job is, I'm impressed by your CrossFit shirt, first of all. Well, I go to CrossFit every afternoon, and I try to. It's, it's incredible. Because yeah. you don't work hard enough? Uh, <laughs> well, I told you, I spent six years in the Army, and I'm used to people telling me how to work out. That's <laughs> right. It's impressive. But just my, my silly question is, being around lobsters all day, are you eating it? Seven days a week? Well, so we have a thing at my house, lobster's so cheap, if you come to my house, you have to eat lobster because I can't afford hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> but no, we've been eating, my, my wife's um, kind of a vegetarian, she doesn't eat chicken or, or meat. And they, she lived on a little hobby farm when she was a kid and she has this, their pet kind of mentality. I just see a cow and I'm like, hey, T-bone, you know, more house, <laughs> so more for me. But, but she does like lobster and seafood, so yeah, I've been, bringing in more. In fact, you offered to bring lobster rolls tonight. Yeah. And I said, we were all lobster now. Yeah. <laughs> so far. yeah. But anyways, I really appreciate your taking the time to listen to me this evening. I hope I wasn't. Thank you. Uh, I hope I was great. Interested. Thank you. And by the way, this, this is my buoy color, so if you see any washed up on the beach, you know where to return. <laughs> so they say you're not just a name, you're a number. Well, same in lobster. 2731, that's me. <laughs> well, it's all yours. <laughs> I sell them on my lawn. Oh, is that your house? Yeah, it's my house, yeah. Now you know your house. Yeah, now you know where I live. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you, Ed. Well, thank you. This it's nice to see everybody. I was on this board for a whole year, and all we came right. out time, all we did was Zoom. That's right. Everybody, follow the channel.